Hello and welcome to the Productivity Exchange. Today we're looking at naming conventions, also commonly known as naming schemes. These can be applied to all sorts of things, images, documents, work items like Jira tickets, files generated by code and more. If you've ever had to keep track of more than a few dozen files or work items at any one time, you'll know it can be tricky to keep on top of what item belongs where and where each item is up to in the process. Naming conventions are one of the most effective tools to keep things organized and help you keep track of work in flight. For this reason, they become increasingly important the more things scale. There is also no overall best naming convention. It's always going to be context dependent. In this video, I'll give you a step-by-step -step guide for how you can craft a solid naming convention in any situation. I'll also provide you with considerations and trade-offs to keep in mind. Alrighty. Let's jump into it. There are four principles that you'll want to keep in mind when you create a naming convention. Firstly, you'll want to consider scope. What does a scheme apply to? For example, does it only apply to image files or invoices? And is it only for a particular project or is it for ongoing operational work more generally? Secondly, consistency, meaning that it needs to be used consistently by everyone involved. Thirdly, descriptiveness. The names have to describe what the item is. And finally, conciseness. You only want to encode the information that's needed into the name. With these principles in mind, to start crafting a naming convention, you'll need to answer two questions. One, what information do I want to encode? In other words, what information do you need to identify the items uniquely? This could be the date, version number, name of the person who made it, your client, what part of the project it's from, or anything else really. Two, what is the order of importance of the information that you're encoding? Whether they're files, Jira tickets, or anything else, odds are you'll look at them in an alphabetically sorted list. The order with which you encode the information into the name can give you certain advantages in terms of how items are grouped. Let's look at the following example. Say I'm working on a project to create a series of mathematics textbooks for the common core curriculum in the US. When I look at the files in the folder, I want the assets to be ordered by what book they're in. I also want the assets to be grouped sequentially by chapter, section, and subsection. I also want to know what contractor or employee created the asset, and I want to know what the asset contains in the form of a short description. In this case, I want the book ID, chapter, section, and subsection, asset type, contractor ID, and a content descriptor. So this file is an image of half a pizza created by external graphic design company, abbreviated to EGDC, for chapter 12, section 3, subsection 2 of the grade 6 textbook. Looking at how these files will sort alphanumerically, first this will group all of the assets by book, for example, CC6, then by chapter, section, and subsection, and then by asset type, I for illustration, then by the creator, and finally by the content description and the file extension. When you start crafting the convention, it helps to keep the following things in mind. For dates, I prefer to use international date format of year, month, date. This arranges the items by year, then month, then date, when the list of items is sorted alphanumerically. It also avoids confusion about whether the date format is American or European. I also use four digits for the year to further avoid this confusion. If I use double digit years, this date could mean the 12th of October 2022, the 22nd of October 2012, or the 10th of December 2022. Also consider if you want to separate the components of the date for readability using underscores or hyphens like this on the screen now. Avoid spaces. While you may be able to get away with spaces in a file name in most usual settings, there are instances where it can cause real issues, like when your files are going to be published online or when you use a script to automate your work. Some operating systems also don't allow you to use spaces in file names, but that's relatively uncommon these days. You should also be careful about using special characters in your naming scheme. Things like slashes, full stops, asterisks, ampersands, dollar signs, emoji, and more might be fine for work items in systems like Jira and Trello, but they wouldn't work for file names. A good rule of thumb is to only use web safe characters and your best bet will always be to only use lower and uppercase A to Z, the numbers zero to nine, hyphens and underscores. 
To make sure your names are still readable, consider the following four cases. Snake case, kebab case, camel case, and pascal case. You don't need to stick to any one of them exclusively either. You can use a combination of these to group things together visually. As an example, this mix of kebab, snake, and pascal case is easier to read than any of these others on screen that stick exclusively to one of the formats. Remember, for our naming convention to be useful, we want it to be human readable. This also helps prevent errors and increases buy-in from colleagues. To keep things concise, use abbreviations for things that are too long. This includes client names, employee names, product identifiers, etc. In our example earlier, we abbreviated external graphic design company to EGDC. Similarly, we can abbreviate names to initials, either first or last, or first, middle, and last in the case of a clash. It's important though that everyone knows what they mean and uses them consistently. You need to document the details of your naming convention and have buy-in from everyone who needs to use it. You should keep this documentation somewhere central where everyone has access to it. For example, on a team documentation space like Confluence or a wiki, or a shared file storage space like SharePoint. And lastly, you want to use the least complex naming convention you can get away with, while still encoding all of the information you most need. This will help you get buy-in from colleagues and reduces the amount of documentation you need to create. It also means fewer opportunities for people to stuff up. The power of a naming scheme comes from its consistent use, so we want to minimize opportunities for human error and make it as simple as possible to use. Looking at the previous example, Let's critically evaluate what we came up with. Did we really need to encode the asset type into the name? If we're only dealing with files, could we just let the file type tell us if it's a graphic word document, etc.? Do we need the asset type specifically broken down into subcategories? As an example, if it's a graphic, does it need to be explicitly broken down into categories like photograph, illustration, or diagram? Or can we get away without it? It will likely depend on how many assets we're dealing with overall and whether it's important. Since we've gone down to the chapter and subsection, it's not likely to be more than a handful of files, so do we really need this identifier? If, on the other hand, we decided to break the work down into individual tickets on Jira, Trello, or similar, and use these names as the title of the work ticket, we may want to drop the asset type along with the contractor ID and descriptor and pass a ticket through the workflow. We could use labels or tags in those systems instead and rely on the ticket history. Ultimately, it will depend entirely on how you set up your work and what is important to capture. Naming conventions have additional benefits beyond being able to find items and track progress more easily. Because you have a way to identify the various components of your project, you can make it easier to create a list of expected assets or tasks to be completed. This will help you determine the size and scope of your project and makes it substantially easier to plan resourcing and timelines. To sum up, think about what bits of information you want to encode into the name, what order makes sense for these, and how you can make it as user-friendly as possible. Keep in mind that you want it to be consistent, concise, and descriptive. Remember, this is best thought about at the start of the project. Renaming a ton of files partway down the track is never fun, and while there are tools that let you bulk rename files like Microsoft Power Toys, this change is likely to create confusion, particularly in teams larger than a handful of people. You'll have to weigh the benefits, but in my experience, all but the most minor changes to a naming convention are best avoided if you're partway through a project already. And that's it for this video. Let me know in the comments if there's anything I missed that has worked for you. If you found this video helpful, please like the video and share it with someone who may also get value from it. And consider subscribing to see more videos like this one from me in future. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.